War should be the absolute last option. Unfortunately, we seem to take it as like oh, door number two or three. We can defeat any military in the world in a conflict. There's, there's no doubt about it. We just have superior technology. We have superior training. It's not going to be easy. That's the part that we trip up on. And what are we willing to sacrifice for victory? If you're going to war, you have to have the will, the will to kill and the will to die. And when you say the will to kill, what's hard about that is you don't just kill the enemy. When you go to war, civilians get killed too. And so you have to have the will to do that. You don't intentionally do it, but you have to recognize that that is going to happen. And then you have to have the will to die, which means no matter how good you are, you're going to lose troops. If you've been following me a while, you know that I've been drinking AG1 all year, no matter where I go or what I do, if I'm at the racetrack, if I'm in Europe for six weeks, no matter what, I'm drinking AG1 every single morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, what I noticed was that my gut health improved. I could eat so many different foods without it bothering me. My skin has gotten better. My hair is healthier. So many functions that everybody wants to get better got better. It's so awesome. And I've been bragging about it so much that my friends and my family have also started taking it and they love it as well. AG1 is the supplement that I trust to support my body's daily needs. And that's why we have been partners for so long. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 K2 plus five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. Check it out. Okay, so I met you at the CrossFit Games and I was yes. very excited when uh, you sponsored it because I thought maybe Jocko will be there and I want to meet him. And then we were there for a few days. Uh, my sister loves it. And so I didn't know if you were going to come and I thought that'd be totally understandable. You're sponsoring it. But then I'd heard that you were there. They're like, oh, there's Jocko. And I thought, oh my God, I want to meet him. We had just a really fun, like 15 or so minute conversation mm -hmm. before you had to carry on. One of the things that we first started talking about that I'm most fascinated with is because I, I, I love to help and be inspiring, but sometimes it's hard to know how to be inspiring if it's in you. And so what we were talking about is I was like, how do you, if it's just in you, how do you learn how to teach it? How do you inspire people? Like where, is that important to you in general? When I go through my life, when I interact with other people, I don't really think in terms of, hey, I'm going to try and inspire this person. That's not really something that I'm thinking about. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, a byproduct of being around other people. And when you, when, when someone meets you, when I meet, when I meet you and you're talking to me about what you did when you were 16 years old and 20 years old and you did this, and it's like, oh, that I'm learning about you, but I'm also, there's a byproduct of thinking, Hey, this girl stepped out in this whole other world. That's pretty inspiring. So I don't think of it as a proactive thing that I'm actively trying to do. Mm -hmm. If it's happening, it's more of like, I, I suppose, a collateral, a collateral result of just interacting with people. Okay. It's not something that I'm consciously yeah. trying to do. Now, listen, if I was talking to when I was a SEAL platoon commander and I was talking to my guys, even then I wasn't thinking like, oh, I'm going to try and inspire these guys to do this thing. But what you're saying is, hey, this is what we got to get done. This is how we're going to do it. This is why it's important. And I think those things can definitely be inspiring at times. What is it about being able to lead that team to be able to inspire them if you're, the platoon needed that? What is it about you that you've realized gives you that skill set? So growing up in the military, right? I grew up, I joined when I was 18 years old and I was observant. So I wasn't the fastest guy, I wasn't the smartest guy, I wasn't the strongest guy, I wasn't the best shot. So I always knew that what I was going to be able to deliver wasn't going to be one of those things, right? So I was paying attention to like what my leadership was doing, how they were interacting, what they were doing from a planning perspective, how they were thinking about problems that we were going to have to overcome. And so I was paying attention to that stuff. Sure, I was paying attention to try and be a better shot and try and be stronger and try and be faster. My, my talents were limited in that area. Huh. So 
what could I do? I knew I could figure things out. I knew I could communicate and I paid attention. I would say it started from me just paying attention to the people in leadership positions and thinking to myself, oh yeah, when, when this guy said that thing, that made sense. When this other guy said this other thing, it didn't make sense. When this guy was humble and treated us with respect, it made us really want to support and help him. When this person was arrogant or treated us like we were below him, that really made us not like that leader. So I paid attention to that stuff and over time, you know, learned some lessons. Mm. You mentioned problem solving and I would imagine that's something that, you know, you obviously do that at a very high level and need to do that in really critical situations. So how do you teach problem solving now? And what was it that you learned that, you know, what is the formula for problem solving? Yeah. So there's a couple key components. First of all, the way you get better at problem solving is by problem solving. Now, I can't throw an ultra complex problem at you if you have don't have any experience problem solving. I've got to give you like a smaller problem mm. and let you figure out how to solve that smaller problem. Mm. And then I'll give you a little bit more complex one, a little bit more complex one, a little bit more compl- complex one over time. But here's what you are going to learn. And this is what we are trying to teach is the solution to the problem is very difficult to see from inside the problem. It's very difficult to see what the problem is from inside the problem. So what we teach and what I teach is to is for people to remove themselves from the problem so they can see the whole picture from the outside. We call it detachment. So detaching yourself from the problem so that you can see more broadly what's happening. Mm. And from there, you'll find a solution. It's like in your life when you're having some problem and then you're like, I don't know what to do. And so you go for a run. Yeah. And in the middle of that run, uh, you're like, oh, here's how I should solve that. Yeah, just a little or, space. Or sleep on it. Yeah, sleep on it. Or there's some problem that your team is involved in and you don't know, you know, you've been at lunch and when you come back, you look at the problem for four seconds, you're like, hey, change this. And they go, oh, oh okay. Mm-hmm. It's because you weren't all in the involved and surrounded by the problem. So teaching people to take a step back, take a breath, look around, that's how you become a bit a good problem solver with one more component, which is having an open mind. Mm. Opening up your mind because if you already think you know how to solve the problem, you're not going to be looking for a solution and you're going to keep trying the same solution which isn't working and that's why you're having a problem in the first place. Yeah. So Detaching, taking a step back and having an open mind for whatever solution can come yeah. is the way that I teach and that's what I taught in the SEAL teams mm. and that's what I teach now. What personality traits lead someone to not being open-minded? Ego, having a big ego. Um, when you have a big ego, it just shuts out everything, right? So now all of a sudden, if I have a big ego and I'm looking at a problem, I already think I know the solution. So and not only that, I'm not listening to you. So when you're trying to tell me, hey, Jocko, it seems like this is the thing, I, I might be like, she doesn't know what she's talking about because my, my ego is too big. I think I'm smarter than you. Mm-hmm. I think I'm better than you. So I'm not listening to what you say. So having a big ego is the primary problem that we have to overcome to get people to figure out solutions. Do you think that you can take someone with a big ego, though, and get them to dampen it and yes. temper it you do because it seems like one of those things that if you have a big ego you're not willing to even go the, to the place that says so what is it that gets someone with a big ego to get in check and put themselves in a more humble open-minded state so there's like a tipping point there's like a critical point oh. where if someone is beyond this critical point with their ego you're right like they can't be saved they're a narcissist they, they literally can't be saved yeah and this is when we would fire someone in the seal teams from a leadership position they would be in that zone where you'd say hey the way you ran that operation that plan you didn't think through that plan and their immediate response is oh yes i did it's just that the weather was bad or we didn't expect this or my new guys are yep they're just pointing fingers so those guys they're, they're, they're going to get fired. Okay. And it doesn't happen very often because most people aren't full on in the full on ego category where they can't be saved. Right. Most of the time, like, oh, the guy's got a big ego. And you're like, hey, man, the way you guys hit that target was a bad call. And hmm. they go, what, what do you think I should have done? Like they, mm. they at least go, yeah, I could have done better. And as long as you get that, as long as they can just have a little bit of humility in there, you can probably bring them back. Now, one of the ways that 
I used to take someone that has a big ego and, and get a little humility is I would put them in charge of a training operation that I knew that they weren't going to be able to handle. <laughs> and so then, you know, I say, okay, Danica, here's the mission. You're going to go out and hit, hit this target. And you're like, oh, I got it. No problem. And you're all <laughs> cocky and arrogant. And then you go out, you hit the target, everything goes to shit. And you come back and I said, hey, how was that? And you're like, I, I need some help. You know what I mean? And then all yeah. of a sudden we can talk and I can say, hey, here's what you need to think about in your mission planning. Here's the way you should utilize this uh-huh. weapons asset. So, so you start small with something that they yeah. have to concede to. Yes. yes. It's that like 2 to 3% harder every time. I think it's, uh, yep. is that from... Um, James Clear, right? It's uh, from his book. Like it just something needs to be mm-hmm. like two to three percent harder than it was to keep someone involved and not yeah. overwhelm them. So if you have a lack of confidence and, you know, I'm like, hey, Danica, I want you to run this mission. You're like, I don't really think I can do it. Like, I, I'm, I, I don't think I have the experience. Then I might say, OK, here's a little part of the mission. Hey, can you run this small thing? And you go, oh, I, I can do that. And it's something that I know you're competent and capable of doing. So you go out and you do it. Your yeah. confidence goes up. Yep. Yep. And so I build your confidence up with a bunch of small little missions. And then each one gets a little bit bigger and a little bit broader. And the next thing you know, you're running big, complex operations as the ground force commander, which is what yeah. we want. As opposed to someone that's got a big ego and thinks they're doing everything perfect. I'm going to give them something that they can't do well. And it kind of, they get stung. Mm-hmm. And now they come back and they got their tail between their legs like, hey, I need some help with this. Hopefully. Rare case, you get someone that's like, well, it just was a stupid mission. Like, we wouldn't do this in the real life. And it's like, okay. And so you try and talk to them like, hey, actually, everyone's done that mission or this is a standard training mission that we do. It's just that your platoon didn't do good on it. So you have to talk them through and hopefully you can get them to just be a little bit humble, in which case you're going to be okay. Mm. How much does the like community of the, the the guys around play in it? And like, how much is it just the leader versus the whole entire the whole entire operation with everybody? Mm-hmm. Do other people play a big role? Totally. And once again, if you're the leader and you're like an an okay leader, maybe you're even not the best leader, but you're humble, you're gonna be fine. Because you got some guys in your platoon. Look, in a SEAL platoon, there's some studs in there. They yeah. can handle anything. They can make it happen. Yeah. And they'll be like, hey, Danica, here's what we should do. And you'll be like, okay, sounds good. And you just kind of let let the team run it because you are humble enough to know that you don't know everything. Where we have a problem is you're a bad leader. And someone on your team says, hey, Danica, this doesn't make sense. And you're like, hey, we're doing it my way. And now you're going to execute a mission that's not an effective plan and you're going to fail. Mm-hmm. So as long as you have a a leader that's humble enough to listen, Yeah, there's going to be some people, I'm talking in a SEAL platoon, but this is true in most cases, there's going to be some people on the team that are like, hey, here's what we should do, here's how we can step up. But leadership's the most important thing. It's the most mm-hmm. important thing on the battlefield, in business, and life. But in a SEAL platoon, you don't need the actual leader to be the best leader in the world. Hmm. You don't need the platoon chief to be the best leader in the world. You need, you need a leader. Someone on, someone in there has to be able to step up and lead. And as long as you have that, you're going to be fine. Mm-hmm. If there's literally no leadership or you have actual bad leadership, which generally is defined by someone that's egotistical. Because listen, if you're, let's say you're not tactically sound, meaning you don't really know what the best moves to make or you're indecisive or you're just weak or you can't project your plan or you can't simplify. There's all kinds of problems that you could have as a leader. But as long as you're humble enough to be like, hey, listen, I, I'm right. not that good at coming up with plan, but Fred over here, he makes good plans. Hey, Fred, what do you think we should do? As long as you're humble, we'll get the job done. Yeah, yeah. But when you're arrogant, everything's off the table. Which leads me to say, asking for sort of a characterization of what a good leader is. What characteristics would you call being the most important elements to going, this is a good leader? As you can probably guess, humility is the most right, important. Right, right characteristic for a leader. That to me is number one. For me, number two, and it's kind of hand in hand, but is having an open mind and being able to receive information. There's times where arrogant people get intelligence, get reports that they go, oh, that can't be right. Now look, is is all intelligence 100% correct? No, absolutely not. Are all reports 100% right? No. But to just be like, oh, that report's not right. I mean, people do that in business, right? The, 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 sure. the product won't be selling mm-hmm. and the team will come in and say, Hey, it looks like this product isn't moving. Maybe we kind of, we need, we need to make some adjustments. And the response is no, the products it's going to be, people just don't get it yet. 
Right, right, right. Like, oh, so the whole market <laughs> is are, wrong. The consumer's <laughs> wrong, but you're right. Yeah. So if we're not humble and we don't have an open mind, yeah. we're going to have problems. So those to me are the most important characteristics of leadership. And then what you get is a bunch of other little components that play some part like being articulate. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's important for a leader to be articulate. But if I'm in a leadership position and I'm not very articulate, but you're on my team and you are, guess what? I'll be like, hey, Danica, can you tell the team what's happening? And you go, yeah, I got it. And you're super articulate and you communicate. So some self-awareness might be a really helpful one too. Self-awareness, mm -hmm. which also requires humility right, to be like, right, oh, right. I'm, not, I'm, not, good at I'm that. not good at this. Danica is. Right. So that's what I'm going to do. Right, right. Is there a healthy amount of ego? Like, is there's a, it's sort of an idea that in business, there's so many narcissists that run companies and they, they build these big companies and you know, that's sort of what I think about when you say like this person can't come back. They can't at all take accountability. They kind of fall more in that end of the spectrum where they're not able to to do it. Like what does a healthy ego look like? And is there a certain amount of that that actually is a really big positive for a leader? 100%. And we already talked about it a little bit, which is, oh, Danica doesn't believe she's capable of doing this job. You're, you're, you're humble to a point where you lack ego to where you don't have any confidence. So I don't want right. so, someone in a leadership position that's like, I'm not sure if I can do this, right? We don't, right. Want, we don't want that person on the team. Right. Not that we don't want them on the team, but we don't want them in a leadership position. So yes, and I think what good, healthy, it's a balance, right? I wrote the book, The Dichotomy of Leadership. It's like a good balance between mm -hmm. being arrogant and being humble. What does that leave you? It leaves you confident, mm -hmm. just a good, confident person. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Actually, I, I'd be interested to talk to you about this. I... Somebody asked me about doing stressful things mm -hmm. and like, what is my protocol for doing stressful things? Mm -hmm. And I kind of talked through my protocol and I realized something. This was only like two months ago on my podcast. I talked about the fact that I went through the protocol. I was like, okay, so what do I do? Well, obviously I train very hard. I prepare. I rehearse. I think through the way things are going to go. I think about what the outcomes are. And then this is the part that I added to my whole thing. And I realized this is something I've done my whole life. Right before the moment of execution, like right before five seconds, five minutes, but before the moment of execution, I get a little bit cocky, just a little bit cocky. So what does that mean? For instance, we're going on an operation. I've been thinking like, okay, we've trained, we've prepared, we've rehearsed, we come up with a good plan. You know, we're, we're, we've done everything we can. Mm. When I get my gear on and put my night vision goggles down, we're gonna kick some ass. Like we're gonna win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, archery, I do archery, and you're you're going. You know, you you have to practice. So how do you how do you do well in archery? What's your protocol? It's a stressful thing shooting at a target, shooting at an animal if you're hunting. It's a stressful thing. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Well, train, prepare. Go go do rehearsals. Visualize what it's going to be. I do all those things, right? But for me, one key component is like when I am going to take a shot. What goes through my mind is like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to bullseye this shot right now. Like oh, that's what's yeah. going to happen. You have to. You have to. It's you like, have, have you ever played golf? I, no. Uh, I, I'm golf sorry. always seems like the first one. Like you stand over the ball and you have like you could have twenty thoughts, you know, and one of them could be many times it could be like, what am I doing? And then you swing and of course you have a horrible, or like this isn't gonna be good. And of course yeah. you have a horrible shot, but then mm -hmm. if you go, I'm gonna drill this or even make a joke, be like, guys, watch this. I'm yep. gonna, I'm gonna like, I'm, I'm gonna nail it. It's going on the green. And you like, you, you can really talk yourself into mm -hmm. it. So like, that's an interesting spot with ego is that how many times do you think that you can convince the platoon of something that they don't believe because you do. Like your mm -hmm. ego or arrogance or confidence right there like gets it over the goal line for everyone else that they can, they siphon your confidence mm -hmm. off of you, that they, 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 they then believe something that they wouldn't, advise, wouldn't otherwise. Have you ever had experiences like that? When we talk about belief, for me, and I had to define this to explain what I meant by this because Making sure that people believe in what they're doing and believing that they can accomplish it is absolutely critical. Yeah. But to me, belief isn't like uh, if you believe it, you can achieve it. And if I read it, it was like, oh, yo, if you believe it, you can achieve it. That 
doesn't get at least not a seal platoon and most high performing teams, you're not going to be able to convince them of something that's not believable. What for me, what belief is showing people that there's an actual pathway to victory. There's an actual way of achieving this. It's like, hey guys, this is going to be a really hard mission. But if we do this and they go, hmm, and we do this mm-hmm, and we do this, yep, we'll get here. Yes, we will. And that will bring us here. Yes. And as long as you can show people, this is where we are. Uh-huh. This is what the actual pathway to victory looks like. That's what belief is to me. So belief isn't just some kind of hollow word. Like if you can believe that you can achieve it. Yeah. You've got to actually show people the pathway to victory and the challenges. You've got to show what those challenges are and that it's possible to overcome them. And here's how. And that's to me what belief is. Like you took them on a roadmap Mm -hmm. of two to three percent each step. And so you really took them like 40 percent, but you showed them evidence by proof that there is a pathway to it. Yeah. Wow. We do this in the business world a lot, right? You know, for me to go in and like, oh, our sure. goal is yeah. our goal is to do a hundred million dollars this right, year. Right, right. And people go, well, <laughs> if you just roll in there and say that, people go, but, you know, that sounds far fetched. But if you mm-hmm. say, hey, listen, I broke it down by all our all the lines of operation. What do you guys think we could do this? Oh yeah, we could do this. Oh, what about this section? Or what about this product? About what about this service? And all of a sudden, people start adding up those numbers. Does anyone not think we can do eighteen million with no. this thing? And they're like, No, they, <laughs> yeah, we can because we already have this client. We get one more client. That's yeah. gonna okay. And people all of a sudden put it together, and everyone nods their head and says, Yeah, we. Huh. They believe it. Ah, uh-huh. what have you realized about yourself in hindsight too? About just your ability to problem solve, like ability to lay out a roadmap. Most mm-hmm. people. Like it's a total weakness. I have ideas for companies. I have tons of them. And so as we talked about before, like some of them are bad. Um, but I have no, I can't do the roadmap. That's not like, I don't do details. I don't know how it's going to happen. I've got some dream, <laughs> but I don't know how to make it happen. So where did you learn that you, like, what have you, what did you learn about yourself that made you capable of laying this roadmap out? And then how do you teach a roadmap to mm-hmm. someone? I do something that I call the iterative decision making process. Mm. Sounds fancy, fancy, but all it really is is and and it, so I was kind of known in the SEAL teams as being a, dis, devi, a decisive person, meaning like, Love it. oh, I'm going to make decisions. But I kind of cheated, <laughs> kind of cheated the whole time because what I would actually do is in, if there was a problem on the battlefield, there's a problem. Instead of me trying to make a big giant call that's going to solve that problem with one swift move, which take, which is really hard to figure out, really hard to predict, and there's a lot of variables that you can't account for. Yeah. Instead of trying to solve everything with one big move, I would just take one small step. So my decision would be very fast. Hey, we're going to move to the next building. Look, there's a there's a building that has enemy in it, and it's four blocks away. And we're taking fire from them. I just don't say, all right, attack that building (laughs) because we don't know what's actually there. We don't know how many enemy there is, but you have to make a decision. So my decision would be, hey, everyone move to the next north building. It's a very small decision. We're just moving one building, 30 yards. But you're going to collect a little more information. We're going to get more information. Once I get that next piece of information, I'm going to make another small decision. And you can do this in business as well. Oh, wow. So... If you want to start making supplements, which like I started making supplements, I didn't come out with a line of supplements. I started with a supplement to see if there was a market for that supplement. And if people appreciated having stuff that was very clean and very ethical, and I wanted to make sure that people wanted to pay for that. And it's like, okay, so we made one. Yep. Hmm. Yep. Definitely people like it. Okay. Well, let's make another one. And we continued that down the path. Same thing with clothing. Make clothing. Make clothing made in America. To me, I love the idea of buying American made clothing. Yeah. It's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to make things in America. Expensive. Yeah. Can be expensive. So, well, did we go out and, you know, buy multiple factories? No. We started with one little tiny factory. And guess what? We started making a couple little products. And as, People bought those products. It was like, okay, we can add another product to the product line. Yep. Oh, people definitely want that too. Hmm. What about jeans? Everyone in America wears jeans. Let's start making jeans. So Hmm. to me, that's the way I do the problem solving is I take small 
iterative steps. First of all, I'm not in the problem, like I said earlier, but then I take small iterative steps, keep moving in the right direction. And by the way, I'm humble enough that if I get feedback, yeah, we made this one supplement and no one likes it and they don't care and they'd rather just get a cheaper product that's not quite as good for them. That's what the market is. Okay, well, I went in the wrong direction and I hmm. I didn't overinvest in it, didn't make too much. Yeah. Maybe people don't care about buying American made jeans. Okay, so we, we made 200 pairs and it's like, yeah, no one bought them. You know, we spent whatever we spent on them. It's kind of a, you can kiss that money goodbye. But we make 200 pairs and they're sold out very quickly. Okay, let's make 400 pairs next time. And so that's, that's what I do, do, but I have to remain humble enough to actually listen to the feedback that you get. Because sometimes we make a product that doesn't land right. And people are like, no, they don't buy it. Cool, I don't say, no, they just don't understand it. No, I don't understand the market. Did you make mistakes early in your life where you went too far too fast and learned the lesson? Is this inherent within you? Or was there at some point in time where you go, okay, I don't need to jump in the deep end. Okay, we don't need to do this. This is a better approach. A little, you know, slow and steady wins the race. Yeah. You're never slow and steady. But, but taking it one step at a time in this patient fashion is actually the fastest way. Yep. It is actually the fastest way. And... For me, there, there's not a whole bunch of like eureka moments uh -huh, in my life yeah, yeah. where I was like, oh my gosh, I need to change the way I think. For me, it was, look, I was in the SEAL teams, joined when I was 18 years old. And when you're a new guy in the SEAL teams, you're not in charge of anything. Like you're in charge of like a piece of rope. Like, hey, make sure we have rope to tie the boats off. I'm like, okay, I got the rope. I got the rope. Like that's what you're in charge of. But I was watching. And I was observant. And so I got to see, oh, my boss just like committed all of us to assault this target without leaving any reserve behind. How'd that work out? Not very well. That doesn't seem like a good idea. So just over time, I paid attention to it. And, and I, I bet there's something to do with taking risk, but also doing a risk assessment and saying, yeah, we take risks, but we do it in a in a manner where we're not over leveraging or we're not putting ourselves in a situation where we're going to lose leverage that's one thing i an underlying an underlying sort of theme in my life is i don't want to give you or the enemy or the market or the bankers leverage to the point where i don't have a, a way out I don't have some kind of control. Look, I'll take risk, but I'm not going to put myself in a situation or I'm going to try as hard as I can not to put myself in a situation where I'm stuck. Oh, so there's always a way out. You're always making sure there's a way out. I'm, I'm there's like a there's, there's like a there's a pathway to freedom somehow some way. It's a contingency planning, right? It's contingency planning. We're not going to go and do this where I can't get out of this situation. Huh. And so I think that means taking smaller steps so that I don't end up, you know, borrowing money to build a factory right. that to make jeans that no one wants to buy. Or going broke and being like, "Well, I've started all over. That was yep. stupid." And yep. This this humility thing I find to be, uh, it seems to be basically at the foundation of a lot of this is your ability, the open mind, open mindedness and humility kind of go hand in hand. So where did that come from? Again, I feel like so much is like in you, mm -hmm. but I'm trying to figure out like all of this is like, how do we help other people have these values? And so how did you learn it and how do you teach it essentially? So is humility from being in the atmosphere of being around military, around SEALs, around, is it just that? And if it's just that, then what are those values? And if not, is it a lesson that was learned? Is it the way you were were, were raised with certain values in the house? Were there certain certain rules you had about making your bed? Or, or what were those things that make you have so much humility and open-mindedness that you can do these jobs uh, that are uh, to do this job at all? So like I said, it wasn't a eureka moment, but there's absolutely a uh, scenario that I went through. I wrote about it in this book called Leadership Strategy and Tactics Field Manual. I was in a SEAL platoon and it was my second SEAL platoon. So I had a little bit of experience and we had a good core group of guys 
everyone was solid except for the guy that was in charge of the platoon. And he was everything that I just talked about. Like, hey, the one thing you can't have is someone that's super arrogant, yeah. super egotistical. <laughs> he was that guy. Mm. He didn't listen to anybody else. He imposed his plan on us. He, it was his way or the highway. And it was bad. And so because he only has one brain and he's trying to come up with a complex plan to conduct a training operation, and this is in the 90s, there's no war going on, but we're conducting training operations. He doesn't have the ability, the cognitive ability, no one does to create an entire plan by himself, but that's what he was trying to do. Mm -hmm. So us in the platoon were saying, hey, sir, we should do this. No, we don't need to do that. Hey, sir, we might want to come over here. No, we don't. We're doing it my way. And that's how he was. Wasn't listening to anybody else. Totally arrogant. And... Quite frankly, he also was pretty demeaning when he talked to some of the guys in the platoon. He kind of nice. walked around. Totally insecure. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a whole backstory on why yeah. he was like that. Primarily, it was because he didn't have much experience. So in order to make up for his lack of experience, he walked around thinking and trying to act like he knew everything. Mm. To, make a, to make a long story short, we ended up having a mutiny in that platoon. And we went... Within the, within the platoon or with him? Mm. With him, we went above his head in the oh. chain of command and told his boss that we didn't want to work for this guy anymore. Is this not, is this a taboo thing to do? Totally taboo. Okay. Totally taboo. Like the worst thing you can do in the military is wow. like to have a mutiny. In fact, the punishment for mutiny is death. Like mutiny is not allowed. Now look, we weren't going to get executed, but because this was in the 90s and it was just, we went and said, hey, this guy's arrogant. He doesn't listen to us. And it sucks to work for him. And that guy ended up getting fired. And when that guy, so when that guy got fired, a <clears> guy <throat> came in to take his place. And the guy that came in to take his place was this legendary SEAL. Oh. And I didn't know him. No one, no, no one in the platoon actually knew him, but we all knew his name. Oh, wow. We all oh. knew this guy. He had combat experience. He'd come up through the ranks. Oh, wow. He'd gone all the way up on the enlisted side to being almost the top of the enlisted side of the chain of command. And then he came back and be, became an officer and he was working his way through that. Just legendary guy. And the first time I saw this guy, we were waiting. We were told, hey, you're getting this guy to take over your platoon. And we're all kind of like, oh, hell yeah. And then I was kind of like, hey, guys, they're doing this because they want him to come in here and like smash us because we're the mutineers. We're the yeah, mutineers. right. Exactly. Like they're, they're bringing they're them us, in. To, yeah. They like they didn't kill you all, but they're gonna kill you yes. all. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, oh, we're screwed. Like we got this badass guy coming in that's gonna take our lunch money. Oh, and so I'm standing there. We had a a little Quonson hut, a little like a like a contractor trailer, like a yeah, construction uh-huh. trailer. Yeah, yeah. Like you yep, almost hit yep, when you were younger. Yep. So we're in one of those. That's our platoon area. And we're waiting. He's coming in after lunch. So it's like one o'clock. We're supposed to be in there waiting. And I'm like- This is the first time you're meeting him? First time I'm meeting him. I'm I'm literally looking out the window, like waiting for him to come. There's little curtains on the windows. I'm looking. And like one guy comes out, another guy comes out. Finally, a guy comes out and he's kind of walking towards us. And I'm like, is this him? I go, no, this can't be him. Because you don't know what he looks like. You don't know know what he looks like. Just know his name. But I'm looking. I'm like, this could this be him? I'm like, no. The guy looked kind of like small. And I'm kind of like, mm, this this can't be this legendary guy, you you know. And he keeps coming. Small's not bad. Small's not bad, mm-hmm. but you know, you have in your mind totally. of what this guy's yeah, going to exactly. be like. Yeah. So I'm, oh, this can't be him. He's this kind of skinny guy, kind of small looking. Now it can't be him. Keeps coming, gets closer. I'm like, this definitely can't be him because this this guy's old. I wonder why he's a legend. You know, I this guy's old. He looks like he's probably at least 35 years old, which to me at the time was like the oldest person oh, I've ever geez. seen in my life. And he walks in and he he says, hey guys, sorry to hear about what happened with your last boss, but I'm not worried about it. I'm just looking forward to working with you all now. Oh. Totally humble. Oh. Look, wants to work with us. You know, he's not like, I'm the commander now, or I heard about what happened and there's a new sheriff in town. None of that. Just I'm looking forward to look, working with you guys. That afternoon, he's cleaning out the garbage, sweeping up the platoon space and taking out the garbage himself. That was like a job for the lowliest new guy that was in trouble. And here he is doing it. And to make this guy, that's the way he was. The, The most experienced guy, the senior guy, and the most humble guy. And what I got to see at that young age was the difference between someone that's arrogant and someone that's humble. And someone that 
doesn't respect, tr treats people without respect and someone that treats people with respect and someone that doesn't trust the team and someone that trusts the team. And someone that l doesn't listen to anything we say and someone that listens to what we say. Mm. So I took all of that from that guy. And I don't know if I would have seen it so clearly if we hadn't have had the arrogant guy you first. You had contrast, you I had a got delta. To see you the go, contrast. What? And so because of all that, I mean, we love this guy. To this guy, to this day, that's the guy I'm trying to imitate. That's the guy I'm trying to emulate. Wow. And everybody that ever works for him, they, that's how they feel. And so that's what I always tried to do. And I never did it as good as him because he was just like the best, but that's what I tried to do. So when you ask me where that came from, that's where it came wow. from. Did he just purely lead by example or was there actually some kind of education and learning process? If you want to emulate that, essentially there might be questions. Was he able to articulate it or was it just purely lead by example? Pure example. Wow. And that's mm. like so much of what you do. Never talked about it's your 4.30 a.m. watch, this yeah. example. Never, he never actually talked to us about leadership. What? Never, never talked to us about leadership. Never sat down and said, hey, here's what you should watch out for. It was all example and osmosis. Yeah. That, that's like something to dig into because it's unique because there's so many books on leadership, right? And it's like very hard. So it's more about like the puzzle pieces of what, how you act that makes you a great leader. And then you end up getting called a leader. Mm. So is the only way that you can learn how to be a leader is to be around someone that's a great leader? No, because I learned a lot from the bad leader and he's not the only bad leader that yeah, I learned true, from. True, I learned true, so true. much from leaders where I'd say, hey, I'm not going to act like that. I was perhaps I can get an iota of credit for having the introspectiveness to say, why don't I like this guy? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's because he treats everyone like we don't know anything or he doesn't listen to us or he doesn't trust us or he doesn't respect us. Oh, I was at least aware enough to realize, to ask myself, why do, why do we hate this guy? Because we hated him. Why do we hate this guy? Oh, it's because he acts like this. Mm -hmm. And then six months later, why do we love this guy? Mm -hmm. Oh. He listens to us. Oh, he treats us with respect. Oh, he is influenced by us. Hmm. Yeah. And so he's humble this... enough to be influenced by us, and yes. we are his, he is our superior. Yes. Which leads me to ownership being, you know, foundational, right? So where did you learn the hard way in any way with ownership? Was there a point in time when you were ever cocky? Was there a point in time you ever pointed the finger more so that you thought, Oh, oh, it's a lot easier. Or did, cause some, it's just this wonderful paradox in life of it's actually in your true honesty that you get someone to trust you, even if you like say something that you did wrong mm -hmm. or say something negative, mm -hmm. even like, cause then they can trust that when you say something else that's positive or good, that they believe you. Like there's so much in honesty. So, What's your what's the relationship with with ownership and how did that become something that you were so good at and 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 could could then lead the way with that? It's something that is embedded, unwritten, not always followed, and yet always known inside the SEAL teams. So you are you know, shooting at a target and you miss the target. And I say, hey, Danica, what happened on that shot? And you go, oh, my, my scope was set wrong. As soon as you say that, everybody kind of knows that you just blamed your scope for your shot, right? <laughs> the wind, the whatever. Yeah, the wind, the whatever. It's like, there's always excuses to make. Uh -huh. And it's, like I said, this wasn't like talked about. No one said, they might say like, oh, it's, it's not the shooter or it's not the, sh not the equipment, it's the shooter. Like someone might say that to you, like it's not the archer, it's the arrow, or it's not the arrow, it's the archer type thing. They might say that to you, but it's not like, it wasn't like a foundational thing that got taught to you mm -hmm, in like, mm -hmm. hey, here's, here's a list of things you mm -hmm. need to think about. It wasn't mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. It was always an undercurring, undercurrent theme of, of how to behave. So was it one of those things where if they, if you did say like it was the scope, they'd go, you know, uh, 
they'd come out with some, some something simple like you're in charge of the scope. Yes. So so it implied in every correction, yes. they would always turn it back on you because I mean, when you're out there in battle, like you can't point, I mean, you need to be yeah. freaking accountable. But I don't want to make it sound as if it was this mantra within the SEAL teams. Right, right, right. Because it wasn't. It was a mindset. It was an underlying thing that not everybody did. Huh. Oh. Do you know who did it? The guy that was humble when our platoon messed up. You know Mm -hmm. what he said? Hey, I should have done a better job overseeing. When the arrogant guy messed up, you know what he said? You guys should have done this better. So again, I learned so many lessons from that contrast. And part of that thing was that taking ownership is infinitely superior than placing blame on other people. Mm-hmm. And and I had another funny thing that happened to me. I was going through basic SEAL training mm-hmm. and I went on, we have a timed swim. So it's like a two mile timed ocean swim. When you're swimming out in the middle of the ocean, someone has Already, to do- that makes me nervous. <laughs> someone has to do the, what's called the guiding. We call it guiding, but it's basically the navigation. Sure. So, and we would trade off navigation. So I might be navigating for a while, which means a little bit extra work for me, or maybe it's because I'm the one that's facing the beach and and then you do it for a while and then I do it for a while, then you do it for a while. And, and I, you're both swimming? You're both swimming. Do you literally like, have to do the two miles yourself? You're doing the two miles yourself. Yeah, yeah, oh, you're, oh, you're wow. swimming two miles, but the off. person that's guiding usually is a little bit ahead, like one foot ahead, uh-huh. and just kind of peeking out and seeing where you're going. Okay. And when you don't guide well, you go a little uh, too far this way, a little too far that way, so you end up swimming a lot further than you needed to. Right. So my swim buddy and I, we fail this swim. Hmm. And we fail this swim, and I knew that I was pretty decent at guiding. And he wasn't great, he wasn't awful, but he wasn't a very fast swimmer. So we go to the instructors afterwards, you know, everyone that failed to swim had to go and report to the first phase instructors and explain why you failed to swim. And so we go in there, you know, it's getting called in pair by pair. So my pair with this other guy, we get called in and the instructor looks up and is like, all right, what happened? And without missing a beat, My swim buddy goes, Willink can't guide well. (laughs) And I was kind of like, oh, dang, just got thrown under the bus here. And what happened was, again, unwritten, unwritten rule, the instructors were like, oh, it's his fault, huh? They kind of jumped on him him a little bit because they knew that he was just blaming me. I mean. Again, an unwritten rule. And again, if that's, even if that's true, what did you do to help it? Like, why didn't, if Willink's bad at guiding, why didn't you guide? Because then you could pass the swim. So they kind of jumped on him. And that was, there's a thousand things like this that happened in my career in the first year, two years, where I saw people get in trouble for not taking ownership. No, no, those people didn't say, you need to take ownership. They didn't say that. Yeah. I also got to see, you know, people that did, that blamed someone else. And you just think, man, that just sounds terrible. I do not ever want to be that guy. And so that's kind of over time, you just build up this, hmm. build up this, this habit, really, of when there's something wrong, looking at myself first and seeing what I did wrong. What were your parents like? My parents were kind of normal. My dad was a school teacher. My mom was a school teacher. So my dad taught history and sociology and my mom taught English. And personality wise, were they hard? Was your, were they disciplinary? Were they no. easygoing? Were they optimistic? I was a lot as a kid. I had a lot of energy. Energy. I had a lot of, yeah, energy is like the nicest way of saying it. I know the feeling. (laughs) I know why you make these. And when I asked you how many is safe to drink and you said four, I went, oh my God, I would vibrate off the planet. I'm working on number two and I might be levitating by the end of this interview. Yeah. So my parents were, you know, I was a lot, I was a lot to handle. And I think they just kind of Kind of like, hey, let's just hope he lives and, <laughs> and and let him go, and that was it, you know. And then as soon as I could, I joined the Navy and and got out of there. But you know, my my parents weren't some, you know, people probably think my dad would be like uh, the Great Santini. You know that movie? No. The Great Santini is like the the Marine Corps dad right, that's right. yelling at his kids. You know, everyone thinks that that's what, and they, they also think that that's what I would be like as a dad. Oh, well, that's where we're going next. Yeah, but the reality is that's just like you might think that that's how I would be with a platoon. 
but I'm not like that. There's what I am is open-minded. Listen to what the platoon has to say. Actually, what I really want is if you're in my platoon, I want you to run the mission. I don't want to even have to run it. I want you to be able to step up and do it. Why? Because that means you don't need me. Why is that good? Because then if I get shot or killed or you're out there on your own, you can handle it. You're good. I want to develop you into a leader so you don't need me anymore. That's the whole goal. And that is the goal with the kids too, right? Do I want to make my kids have to listen to everything that I say because they don't know how to use their own judgment? Mm -hmm. No, that's terrible. I want them to be able to say, oh yeah, you don't need to worry about me. I'll Like I didn't have curfews with my kids. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. How did it go? Awesome. Why? Yeah. Because you put the fear of God in them? Or? <laughs> I think, no, I put values into them. Like? Like, don't do dumb stuff. When I was a kid mm -hmm. and racing, my dad was like, if you get a DUI or if you get drug tested and fail, you can't race anymore. He would tell me this as a teenager, like 14, 15, mm -hmm. 16, 17. Is it not true? Oh, not true. <laughs> Plenty of people drove without their license and we didn't get drug tested till IndyCar. That took a long time to get to. Like that was not true, but it put the fear of God mm -hmm. in me that if I did those things that I would get in trouble. So I just didn't. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying I didn't have conversations that were like, hey, when if you're drinking, like terrible things happen and you can make mistakes when you're drunk that change the rest of your life. Yeah. And by the way, that's true. Yeah, it's totally so true. it's a little bit of fear of God too. Yeah, right? so like I had those kind of conversations with him, but you know we're going, we're going to a party. Okay, have fun. Don't do anything stupid. We do. It's to a point where I can't even. Did you hold a gun or like? <laughs> I can't even explain. I can't that? even explain to you. Like I said, well, what time are you going to be home? And don't worry about it because we didn't even have those conversations. They'd just be like, yeah, don't do anything. What dumb. time would they come home then? Sometimes they come home at eleven. Sometimes they come home at. Too. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested how uh, we're in this, uh, this uh, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, and weak men mm -hmm. uh, create hard times. And so, like, where are we in that loop? I, I mean, the general consensus right now is that we're in good times processing of creating weak men. Right. That's where, you know, right. that's kind of the you're not a weak man. So I, I, I want this to be like a, like a playlist for like young men. And I, and I do want to make it more specific to men, what we do about that. Like where do, where, what is wrong in society that there is so many mental health issues, that there is so many, um, so many, uh, you know, school shootings, um, and, and a lot of these are led, a lot, a lot of these are, are, are boys or men. Mm -hmm. Um, where are we going wrong in this situation? I mean, we see men, we see people uh, the, that are popular wearing dresses and pearls and things like that. And like, it, it's just, it has to be, a, I, I think to myself, it must be a really, really, really hard time to be a guy right now. To be a guy, it must be confusing, it, you, you know, how to address a woman even. There's this hard hard position of like, am I going to get in trouble? Do I, can I come on to a woman? Like, can I flirt with her? I don't envy men right now. And, I, and I'm curious where, how we navigate out of this. And I feel like you probably at least could have some idea of when you watch this happening in the world, you think to yourself, X, Y, Z. First of all, I always want to start off by saying when this conversation comes up that even though these types of men in this case are seen a lot in like social media, like even though they're seen a lot wearing dresses or wearing pearls or whatever else you said, even though they're seen a lot in social media, that's not overwhelming what American men are like. There's a small percentage of men that I try, like I have a leadership consulting company. I travel all over the world, travel all over the country for sure. Mm -hmm. And most people are out there working hard. They're out there trying to figure out how to do better with their business. They're trying to figure out how they can take care of their customers, how they can take care of their people. Like that's what most people are doing. Yeah. Most people are not engaged in this whole weird world 
that's happening out there. Yeah. There. So 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 that's first of all, and I Fair. you know I have kids, and the kids, my kids are young adult kids, right? 24, 22, 20. And I see who they hang around with. And they hang around with people that are just like what we would consider normal people that are out there doing what they're doing. The girls and the boys, the, the young men and young women. They're, they're being... So because of social media and because of the way the algorithm works and because like when you see, or not you, but when some super conservative person sees someone with a some guy that's wearing makeup and he's like retweets it and that person retweets it it's like it's you see more of it right yeah. and your algorithm fills up with stuff because you yeah. react to it so it gives you more of it there's a whole reason that these things are mm -hmm. kind of coming to coming to there's a psychological attack with the algorithms and the way that yeah. everything works that could fill your feed with more of it just because of one one moment right that's not not a healthy representation of the percentage thank you yes it's not a healthy, it's not a, it's not a true right. representation right. of what it looks like in the world. Now, are there places that look like that? Yes, there are. Are there people that are out there getting a little bit crazy? Yes, there are. What is going to bring us back? I think that it's already swinging back. I think that people already are like, hey, that's not going to lead you to a good life if you behave in this manner. I think that the past few years have been already bringing us back in the other direction. Mm. And probably one of the first things you see when it starts going back in the other direction is a spike on social media of the, the weirdness, right? Because people that are starting to be like more normal are like starting to retweet and repost things that yeah. are outside uh -huh. of that. So I think in the past few years, there's already we're already starting to see the pendulum come back. And I think it will come back and it'll be fine. It goes in cycles. So, but let's let's go a little bit back and go, what does it mean to be weak? What does it mean to be weak? Yeah, what is weak? Instead of we saying like, how do we make a strong man? Let's mm -hmm. just go all the way back to like, what is weak? How would you characterize someone weak? Yeah, I, I think people that are very wrapped up in their emotions, Mm. is is like a, a big one. So if I'm super emotional about things and I'm allowing my emotions to drive my decision-making process, that's not going to lead to good decisions. And I'm being weak because I'm allowing my emotions and also external variables to dictate the way I'm going to act. Whereas someone mm. that has a strong, let's say a strong spirit, They'll be like, no, I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, oh, I don't feel good today. I don't feel like doing this. It doesn't matter. I'm still going to do what I'm supposed to do. Oh, there's these variables that are impacting my world right now. I'm not going to get emotional. I'm not going to freak out. I'm going to do what I'm supposed to do. And I think if that as a cornerstone, everything else kind of falls into place because that means you're doing the right things for the right reasons. That means you're being disciplined with the way you're operating your life. And I think those things will make strong men and women. Mm -hmm. Now, just a caveat. This doesn't mean that you ignore your emotions. I'm not talking about someone yeah. that's completely well, shut down. This is what the conundrum is for men these days. It's like we're being, they're sort of being asked to be more vulnerable, um, but yet there's like vulnerability means emotions. And so mm -hmm. there's, this is like sorting it out has to be hard for, hard for people. Yeah. Or you just say, oh yeah, don't let your emotions drive your decision making, but you still got to put them in the calculus. Let's move on. Who's freaking out about this? You know what I mean? Like, really? Like, who's freaking out about this? What's what's the conundrum? Hey, I saw on YouTube that I should show my emotions more. Yeah, but don't act like a baby. Okay, cool. I can understand that. You know what I mean? Like, this isn't that complicated. <laughs> For you, yeah. it's not complicated. You, you, this is the this is the whole conversation. It's like you are these things, and this is where we started in in Madison when mm. I taught. It's like how can how do you take something that's really in you? and learn about it, observe it and go, oh, I see the pattern and this is how I can, this is how I can teach it to someone. This is how I can articulate it well enough and, and give someone a roadmap to, to doing it because, um, because not everyone's going to have yeah. the luxury of being able to meet you like this. Not everyone's going to have the, they're going to read a book. They're going to see a video. They're going to see a YouTube. They're going to see your podcast, but they don't get the time. They don't, they don't get to watch you day in and day out mm -hmm. to live it, to live the leader. But 
you just kind of answered that question, right? Books, podcasts, interviews. You Before we walked in here, you were on the phone. You're like, oh, he's got a message from one of my friends. He's like, you helped him a lot. Yeah. He says thanks or whatever, like yeah. something like that. You get a lot of messages like that, right? Yeah. I've never met that guy before. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know him. But guess what? He, whatever, whatever this particular case was, there's millions of them. Uh-huh. Stopped using drugs. Stopped drinking. Started working out. Started training jujitsu. Started trying out my job. I've got millions of yeah, those. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So how do we help people? You show them the path. You show them the path. And I think that's probably why my podcast is very popular. My podcast is very popular because people are like, oh, I'm in this situation here. I'd like to do better. I'm going to go to this. That's probably why Joe Rogan's podcast is popular. It's like, oh, you should. And and Joe Rogan doesn't say don't drink or don't, you know, like have fun. I Everyone have fun. But he also shows him getting in the cold plunge yeah. and he shows discipline That's and he shows what, like get sweat out the heat. And if I think for a second that I'm having a hard time, I add 20 minutes, you know, like. That's the way it is. So there's a whole. That's why I said like it's probably already swinging back because you've already got, you know, Jordan Peterson, yep. you know, and, and going out and doing his. Rogan's another great example. Like people are already swinging back in that direction. And I think that the generation that's coming up right now is going to find that because, yeah. because, because it's the right thing to do. Because it really is. And th- this is what I've noticed. Like, you know, I, I, I talk about the path, like it's the, the, the path of discipline, having, being on the right path in life you're going to end up in a much better situation. Yeah. And the further you go off the path, the worse your situation is going to become. And what happens is people go off the path, they don't work hard, they don't work out, they don't eat well, mm-hmm. they drink, they do drugs. Mm-hmm. And, and sure, they do that for two years. And then things aren't too bad, but then all of a sudden, like three years, and maybe they're not where they wanted to be four years, they're like, oh, this isn't working. And and it. and... To have people out there that are saying, hey, come back over here. Get on this path right here. Work out. Wake up the same time every day. Eat good foods. Don't be getting drunk. Don't be doing drugs. Like that kind of thing right there, this is how people text you and say, oh, you're with Jocko? Tell him thanks. Like mm-hmm. that's rad. That's why. Because the, the more you stay on that path of discipline in life, the better life you're going to have. And it might not feel like that all the time. Maybe you want to go out partying tonight and sleep in tomorrow, and that feels good for tonight and tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Maybe for just tonight. Maybe tonight I went out, but tomorrow I already wake up and I'm already like, ah, you know, I missed jujitsu class and I feel like crap. Yeah. You already know that. After one night, you know that. Yeah, yeah. But look, I had a blast last night, and so when I'm 22 years old, that kind of makes sense. But by the time you're 25, you're thinking, man, this isn't working. So I think what you're, what we are probably seeing right now is people kind of wandering around looking at the experimentation that they can go. Look at what happened with the hippies, right? In the 60s, mm-hmm. in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. Like they went off the path. They're doing drugs. They're doing free love, all this kind of crazy stuff. And as they do that, eventually they go, oh, this, doesn't, this isn't really working, right? This isn't really working. And they come back and they become, you know, by the time the 80s rolls around, they become uh, Wall Street people. Yeah, <laughs> right. What and and then we have the '90s, you know. And so, what what is it about? What personality traits do you think people have that get them to that 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 make them ha- lack discipline, lack accountability? Mm-hmm. What is it? What is it? What is it that they're telling themselves in their inner monologue? What is going on in their head that they go do? They drink too much. They mm-hmm. do too many drugs. They don't show for. They don't put the effort in. They they lack essentially. Like integrity, mm-hmm. right? Like they know. What is it? Yeah. I, w- one thing that I always try to convey to parents about their kids and kids, as we know, can be anywhere between the ages of like one and 29, <laughs> maybe 32, right? That's kids, right? Because yeah, yeah. we, is that they have a hard time connecting what they're doing right now and how that impacts the rest of their life. Like when my dad told me, don't do drugs or don't get caught yep. drunk driving or you won't yep. be able to race. So I connected drinking and drugs he, with not having the career I wanted. He made the connection for you. Yeah. And it kept you on the right yeah. path. Yeah. So most people don't make that connection. Huh. And they say, oh, what, what does it matter? Oh, grades. They're, they're thinking about what, what their grades in school are. 
They're thinking about, hey, I just want to pass so I can move on to the next grade. That's it. Hmm. Most, But you know, there's kids in high school. I know you didn't go to high school, but there's kids in high school that from the time they get into high school and they're in eighth grade, they're trying to get into the Ivy League school. So they're getting great grades. Most kids aren't like that. Most kids are like, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. They don't connect that to the future. And go to school for marketing. Those Ivy League kids, yeah. guess what their parents were? Their parents were like, listen, if you don't get good grades right now, you're not going to get into a good school. You're going to be broke the rest of your life. So they they made that connection. The parents made the connection for the kids yeah. in a lot of cases. Yeah, totally. Look, occasionally, does a kid figure out on their own? Yes, but most of the time they don't. So a huge part of what I try and convey to young kids is what you're doing right now is going to impact the rest of your life. And that's a, that's a hard truth. But man, is it helpful when people recognize that. It's that great saying of you're always, you're always one decision away from an entirely different life. Yes, indeed. It's scary. One story that I told in this kid's book was about uh, a friend of mine when I was growing up, a friend of mine named Jeff. And like we were best friends in like third, fourth, fifth, sixth grade. And then we kind of got separated a little bit. He started going down the path. He started like drinking, doing drugs, all that stuff. And I didn't, but we were such good friends that it never like hurt our friendship. We didn't didn't hang around as much, but- But you drifted apart. Yeah, we drifted apart, but we still had like a core friendship that could never be broken. Mm -hmm. And so as we got older, he got more into drugs and I got kind of more on a even more straight and narrow path. And finally I was going in the Navy. And when we were kids, we would run around in the woods with army camouflage on and shoot each other with BB guns with, you know, like that's what we did. So that kind of like warrior thing was in him. By the time we're 18, he's like, he, he's not, he's not coming back kind of from the path he's on. He's on mm-hmm. drugs. He's kind of dropped out of school. Sad. It's just all bad. Yeah. And I'm going in the Navy. And so the last time I talked to him, I was, you know, he said, man, I heard you're like going to go in the Navy. I heard you're going and try and go in the SEAL teams. And I was like, yeah. And he's like, I wish I could go with you. Mm. And I was like, bro, you can. He's like, no, I can't. And like he knew that he had gone too far. And this kid, this guy, Jeff, I, I, I left for the Navy and he ended up, his girlfriend dumped him and he killed himself. And I... When I told this story to the kids, I tell them, hey, you know, he made some decisions and he ended up going to jail, right? That's kind of what I told the kids' story. And when I, but I retold that same story on my podcast and I told the, the adults what actually happened. Mm-hmm. And this was this, the most horrible thing about this is as I thought about this, I Googled him. His name is Jeff Lang. I Googled him and there was nothing. Like nothing. Like I Googled him. Not an obituary or anything. Nothing. Couldn't find an obituary. Couldn't find anything. Nothing. Almost as if he he never existed. And by the way, he was a better athlete than me. He was funnier than me. He was smarter than me. He was like a great charismatic kid. And this book right here, Final Spin, is freaking dedicated to Jeff Lang. And um, yeah, right there for Jeff Lang. Um, (laughs) And all my other books are dedicated to you know guys that i served with that were killed but that book is dedicated to jeff lang and when i told the story to kids i said he made a little decision he made another little decision he made another little decision and sometimes you make decisions they all add up but if you make a mistake you can get back on track but what i told the adults are what you just said there's some decisions that you make that you can't come back from and I'll tell you what, if you remove alcohol and you remove drugs, a lot of those decisions <laughs> yeah, ain't happening. Exactly. Like in the SEAL teams, we make the same joke in the SEAL teams that people <laughs> make about like different cultures of people. Like if it wasn't for alcohol, the SEALs would rule the world, you know, because we just do the dumbest stuff when we're drunk. And it's kind of true, <laughs> like, right? Dangerous, I'm sure. Dangerous, like, stupid me stuff. driving on the road and you guys in regular civil, like regular life of being walking around, like the things you do are so extreme, kind of like me on the road. Yeah. I do extreme things, but only yeah. in that one little area. Yeah. So you guys in regular life are prepared to do all crazy. kinds of <laughs> dumb things. Do some very big dumb things, that's for sure. <laughs> Is there some dumb thing, fun story where you're like, I escaped death and I like, can't believe I did. Oh, and yeah. that was so dumb. I mean, just the amount of times of getting in trouble. 
And I'll, I'll, I did always have, even when I when I drank, I always had like a little, a little sick sense of like, it's time to get out of here. Like grab guys like, hey, well, let's get out of here. I always had that. So when I got in trouble, I, I didn't really ever get caught, you know, got very lucky, very lucky doing dumb things. You had an ability to recognize something about yourself that you realize is just special and unique. Like you go, this is kind of the thing. No, no, I, I, I'm a hard worker. That's okay. That's I'm a hard still, worker. Like that's it. It could honestly just be. I know it's like a, a bit of a conflict, but being humble, like, like even like I just you have so much humility, mm. like that is a superpower in and of itself. Like in the SEAL teams, I realized I could work hard, and I realized that that I needed to work hard because I didn't have the natural capability of some of the other guys. And so mm. I just had to work really hard and I was able to do that. I was, I can, I can put in some hours. I can outwork people. Mm. That'll be my way of, of winning is mm. just outwork them. I want to go back just for a second though, to, to, to Jeff Lang and to the scenario. And when he told you that like, I, I can't go to the seals and you said, no, do you believe that he had a pathway back at that point? Or maybe, but like he would have needed to like go to rehab type situation, sure. which is possible. But I, I didn't know enough at the time. In my mind, I probably thought, yeah, you can get back. Like, dude, just quit drinking and quit doing drugs and go to a recruiter and let's go, yeah, yeah. you know? But the reality of it is probably he, he'd probably gotten in trouble for drugs and because I can't remember if he ever got like actually arrested. If you get oh, arrested sure, yeah. for drugs, like maybe they're not going to take you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I probably didn't know that record. at the time. Yeah. But I can't remember if he'd ever been, he might not have ever been arrested, which in which case, yeah, stop drinking, stop doing drugs, get on the path. Look, there's plenty of guys that are in the SEAL teams that did all kinds of crazy drugs and they cleaned up and came in. So there's plenty of guys that have been like that. So yeah, he actually, yeah, he probably could have. Hmm. I'm curious a little bit about, um, war and like being you know uh being at war like this country's been at war m almost every year right and 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 hundreds of years of history it's there's there's so many years of it and what you think the right role for war is war should be the absolute last option that we ever take Unfortunately, we seem to take it as like oh, door number two or three, like, oh, well. And the reason we do that is because we think we, we're arrogant and we think we can just go do what we want and we can beat anybody. And the reason we have that arrogance is because it's true. We, if we really wanted to win, we can defeat any military in the world in a conflict. There's, there's no doubt about it. We just have superior technology. We have superior training. We have numbers like we could make it happen. The problem is it's not going to be easy. That's the part that we trip up on. <laughs> it's not going to be easy. The enemy is going to get a vote. And what are we willing to sacrifice for victory? And my common thing when I talk about war is if you're going to war, you have to have the will. And the will that you have to have is the will to kill and the will to die. And when you say the will to kill, what's hard about that is you don't just kill the enemy. When you go to war, civilians get killed too. And so you have to have the will to do that. You don't intentionally do it, but you have to recognize that that is going to happen. And then you have to have the will to die, which means no matter how good you are, you're going to lose troops. Mm. So that takes, both those things takes a lot of will because the first time America drops a bomb on a, and civilians get killed and they show a bunch of pictures of civilians dead because of what Americans dropping bombs, what does America do? Oh my gosh, why are we even doing this? Right. So killing innocent people. why are we killing innocent people? And then when our soldiers get killed, we say, oh my gosh, why are we doing this? We're losing our troops. Mm -hmm. So we go into wars thinking we're not gonna have to kill anyone and we're not gonna have to kill anyone innocent or no one innocent is going to die. And we go into wars thinking that we're not gonna lose anybody. And then when that happens, 
When those two things happen, which they do, we start to try and figure out why we're there and maybe we don't need to be there. So we go into wars. We don't have the will to die. We don't have the will to kill, which essentially means we don't have the will to win, Hmm. which is why Hmm. Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq is, that's pretty much what unfolded in those situations. What creates someone having the will to do those things? When you have to win. When you have an existential reason to go to war. So have we been in not not needed wars then? Oh, yeah. But like World War II, well, what we're going to do? If we didn't win that war, the, the world was going to be a tyrannical place run by the Imperial Japanese and the Nazis. So we went into a war that we had to win. Hmm. And therefore, we sacrificed hundreds of thousands of American troops and killed hundreds of thousands of civilians. Hmm. And we didn't bat an eye because we had to win. This doesn't happen when you go into Afghanistan. This doesn't happen when you go into Iraq. This doesn't happen when, you went, when we went to Vietnam. And look, there's reasons that people rationalize why we should do these things. And those reasons on the onset make sense. Oh, we're going to go into Vietnam because if we don't stop communism from spreading in Vietnam, it'll spread throughout the rest of Asia. It's the domino theory. It'll all become communist. So it makes sense that we go there and stop communism. And that's where it starts. It pisses everyone off. And But it's a rationalization that can be argued and you can say, yeah, I guess that makes sense. What they don't say is, hey, we should go into Vietnam to stop communism from spreading and we are willing to kill and we are willing to die. And we don't know what those numbers are going to look like. But you need to put those numbers in a very big capacity because you don't know how hard it's going to be. We think we're going to roll in there and, oh, it's going to be no big deal. We have superior weapons. We have superior technology like I already talked about. But we don't realize, oh, well, the superior technology doesn't matter when you're fighting a, a guy in black pajamas with an AK-47 that's hiding in a tunnel. Mm-hmm. Your technology can't see him. Your technology can't kill him. So what do you got to do? You got to get in that tunnel yourself. Now you're equal. And then who's going who's gonna to care when they die? We killed millions of Vietnamese. We bombed them into, we eventually bombed them into submission, but it's kind of like when England got bombed during World War II, their, their will got stronger because yeah. they, when they got bombed, they were like, oh, actually we survived. Oh, you bombed us you bombed the hell out of us yesterday? They're Nazis and we're still here. Their will got stronger. Mm. You have to bomb someone to such an incredible level to get them to say, all right, we need to, we need to figure out what to do. And that's kind of what we did with the Vietnamese. We hmm. bombed them till they came to the table and said, all right, let's make a truce. You yeah. Know, that if this is thing. where you start. Mm. So yes, these things are, are terrible and war should be the last option. And we should only get into wars that we have to fight and we have to win. So why do we go to so many wars that we don't need then? Like I said, When you have people that assess and they say, oh, this isn't going to be that big of a deal. Like this isn't going to take that long. We're far superior and we have better military. We have better technology. So we're going to win. So it seems like it's, look, they're looking around like, hey, if we lose, we lose a couple hundred guys, like it's worth it because we'll get stability in this, in this area of operations. We lose a couple hundred guys. It's horrible, but it makes sense because think of what we'll gain strategically. And, and that argument makes sense, right? They, go, they, can, they can articulate that. Mm-hmm. Like, hey, we might lose a couple hundred guys doing, mm-hmm. this, doing this war, but we'll save more in the long run because of this, that, and the other thing. Sure. And so people look at it and they go, yeah, that makes sense. What they don't realize is it's not going to be 100 guys. It's not going to be 1,000 guys. It's going to be 5,000. It's going to be 10,000. In Vietnam, it's going to be 58,000. So we have leadership that doesn't understand. Hmm. We have leadership that hasn't been to war and they decide, oh, we're going to roll in there and we're going to put Americans into body bags. Seems like uh, leadership of this country is like such in question. And I feel like we're rolling into a year that's going to be just really very interesting, perhaps scary, aggressive. Um, 
and and with the election year, like, do you get into politics at all? Does it serving our country? Does it? Do you pay attention to a lot? Are you? Do you get into it? Do you have opinions? I I have definitely have opinions, um, but I I would say I don't get wrapped up in the day to day mayhem mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that that goes on. I, I'm not firing off political tweets. I'm not reading a bunch of political tweets and saying, oh my gosh, how can they say that? Because I know that everyone's got their agenda that they're working on and they're trying to make a statement and they're trying to get retweeted. Like there's a bunch of things like that that's going on. So I, of course, I deeply care about the country. I deeply care about the direction that we move in, but I don't get wrapped up in like the day-to-day uh, mayhem that's going on. I, I read the news every day. I read the news a couple times a day. I get it from a couple different sources and I always want to know what's happening. But I'm not one of these people that's freaking out about political situation every day. When you listen to the things that different politicians say and people in power, like what do they say that resonates with you in a positive way? Like this is the way that the country, this is what I, this is what needs to be heard by everyone. This is how the country needs to be led. This is what someone should be saying when they're in the place of power. I, I think that the politicians that engage in the day-to-day mayhem that I just talked about, which is most of them, it to me diminishes, like why are you thinking about that right now? Why, why are you doing that? Why aren't you thinking about the strategic direction of our country? Mm. And they get wrapped. But that's part of America, right? We're on a four-year election cycle, two-year election cycle in some cases. So for someone to get elected, they've got to be popular. They've got to get the sound bites. They've got to get the retweets. That's what they're doing. In order to get a retweet, you've got to make it emotional for people. So that's why you say what you say. And that gets the retweets. And that gets your popularity. And that drives up your funds. So it's all... The system is definitely pretty warped right now. Does that make you sad? Like for ser- serving this country, like defending it with your life and then going, God, it's like poorly run, you know, or it's yeah. it's not, this is not the way it's supposed to be. It, that hurts you? It, it definitely bothers me, but America has been through horrific situations. I mean, we had a civil war. Right? Yeah, right. We had, we had an actual civil war where right. we fought and killed each other. Right. And we got done with that and were able to move forward. Um, late 60s, early 70s, like there was some mayhem in this country. There were, there were police officers getting assassinated in the streets. Like it was a really, there was bombings. There were so many bombings going on in the late 60s, early 70s. We look at every day and think it's the worst it is now. But yeah. when we look at history, there are there have been some truly yeah. bad times. So we, we will get through it. Now, sometimes do I think, wait a second, will we? Yeah, sure, sometimes I think that. <laughs> right. But I also think that when people, like people ask me if I would ever get involved in politics and I say, no, I'll never get invo- involved in politics. Unless it got really bad. And people will, I said that to someone, someone was interviewing me, and now people go, is it bad enough yet? Is it bad enough yeah. yet? Is it bad enough yeah. yet? Yeah. I mean, it's a question. I am, yeah. I will, I have literally like, Jen's done like all my podcasts. I'm, I never talk about politics, mm-hmm. but for some reason, I'm getting pulled in mm-hmm. and I don't know enough. Like I'm mm-hmm. not intelligent enough by any means. Mm-hmm. I, I, and part of what I'm curious about, if I, inter- I interviewed RFK not long ago and you know, what I want to talk about a little bit is like, uh, what's the role of it? Why should I be interested in it? Because I, I'm not, but I'm getting pulled in and I'm, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering, you just said something that is very interesting and maybe it's because it's time. Maybe it's because time for people that usually just kind of get on with their life and try and lead by example. Is there a reason? Like there's a little bit of a... <laughs> well, as we start moving further and further away from sanity, people... <laughs> People say, hey, shouldn't we bring this more saying? When people ask me, is it bad enough? Isn't it bad enough right now? I always kind of respond like, well, you're writing this on a cell phone from a cell phone through a cell phone tower and it has power and there's energy and like you're your in this comfort and your fridge is full. Like, so there's, AC's running. Yeah. We're way far away from where I got to get <laughs> You've involved. You've seen in so politics. much worse. Yeah. If I'm getting involved in politics, it's like as a warlord. Right? <laughs> it's like full on benevolent dictator type scenario. That's what I'll do. But, uh, but you do watch 
And I mean, I watch and I do pay attention and it is definitely becoming increasingly disturbing the what what politics looks like. But again, as you just pointed out, if you look at politics throughout history, there's always been craziness going on. There's always been corruption. And I'm not saying that's okay, but this is the way it is. We've gotten through it before. We'll get through it again. That's what I believe most of the time. I've often (laughs) thought to myself, the people that you would want to be your president or to run the country, there's so many people you can think of that are like really really like strong characters, great leaders, humble, great ideas, heart, care, um, have like run giant companies or grown businesses. And you think you'd be great for this country, but none of them would want the job. Why would no one want the job that should have the job? Well, because the job, there's a lot of miserable components of the job. I mean, I have a lot of friends that are politicians. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, there's a bunch of congressmen that are seal, seals that are congressmen, became yeah. congressmen. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've got a bunch of friends that are in that business and man, it's nasty. It really is. It's just nasty. So I don't, the way I look at it is that's why. And the only thing, again, when you start talking about higher, I think, I think congressmen can kind of run and maybe it's not all about them. Once you start running for like president, yeah. you're going to put up with so much more stuff that the only yeah. reason in most cases someone would run for president is for their to, to satisfy their own ego. And now we get back to the earlier conversation, which is such a dangerous thing to have if you're trying to be a leader. Yeah, you know, it's very disturbing. Yeah. So we'll, we'll see where it goes. I, I, I do think that there is a pendulum, like there's a giant pendulum for everything. And as that pendulum yeah. swings back yeah. and forth and people get more people get more crazy in one direction, it comes back. And right now, like you could say, whether you're talking left or right, the pendulum is swung towards being extreme in those two categories. Instead of saying, well, the pendulum was on the left and now it's swinging back to the right. I would like to think that the pendulum is extreme and it's going to come back to being more, uh, more yeah. central. Instead right? of one or the other, yeah. it's more of an like, energetic sort of like, whoa, it's all just a lot of too contentious, right. too divided. Let's get more to unity and mm-hmm. hearing each other, listening. Yeah. So I think the pendulum will swim back in that direction. I certainly hope it will. I just have one final question. Uh, and it might be hard to answer because you're so humble. But how do you want to be remembered? Uh... How do I want to be remembered? Yeah. I hope I hope my kids remember I was a good dad. Hmm. Yeah. I feel that one. I feel that one. Yeah. Right on. They will. Thanks, Jocko. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.